Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? Wasn't that wonderful? I've never played hockey, but I felt like I did when you described it. I I'm, can't skate. I can't believe I'm standing here in front of this group of people saying, I can't skate. I've tried. I'm pretty hopeless. But I, I skated through you reading your book. So uh, has anybody got any thoughts that they'd like to share with Richard or Jane here this evening? I was going to say, by the way, that if somebody doesn't ask the first question, I have been known to wait. I only have so much patience, and then I actually select at random a person from the audience, and I ask them a very embarrassing question. So somebody better ask the first question. Excellent, because I was going to say I'm getting the hook out if you don't, uh, so people don't come up soon. But I have a question which is sort of at the center of tonight's event. You were invited because you were both born in northwestern Ontario. But in fact, Jane, uh, your family moved uh, to southern Ontario when you were five. Richard, you were a 60s scoop kid. But I would say your, your roots have influenced your writing. But I'd like to hear your, both your thoughts on that. Well, in my case, there were a number of things, I think, that influenced my writing that came from this part of the world. And uh, um, one of the things, I guess, that was interesting about the little mining settlements that appeared and disappeared in northwestern Ontario um, during the period that my parents were emplaced here, and that would be, I was born in 1949, but they came into this part of the world in 1932 when they were very young and first married and when Little Long Lack gold mines opened. Um, one of the interesting things about those places was that people came from all over the world. Um, it was a, they were very multicultural environments and um, people were just trying to get by to a certain extent when my parents were first arrived because um, of course it was the middle of the depression and so you would have guys riding the rods up to what they called Hard Rock Station and then kind of cutting trail through the bush trying to get jobs. Um, and if they were successful, they lived in a bunkhouse up there. Uh, and along with these various people from various backgrounds came the kind of tall tales that one associates with Klondike Gold Rush. Uh, um, tales that lost nothing in the telling and that were told around our dinner table after we had come down from the north. Um, my two brothers are older than me, so they grew up, really seriously grew up in Little Long Lac and they played hockey in the same way that, that Richard did and had all kinds of memories of that kind of thing. But also just the, the characters like Pipefitter Slim and Backwoods Bessie and Coffee Annie, both of whom were reputed to be women of sort of ill repute. And they said that the reason that Coffee Annie was called Coffee Annie was because unlike Backwoods Bessie, she didn't approve of drinking, though she approved of absolutely everything else. <laughs> and so we had those kind of tales being told to us all the time. And I think that likely that oral narrative thing worked its way into my own work. Richard? Well, I was born on a frosty Friday morning in 1955, in October. But I don't remember any of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I do remember as a, a, a kid in foster care, my first foster home, my second foster home, of being completely confused by that process and not understanding why I was where I was or what the reason was for being there and being really, really afraid that if I made the wrong move that I was going to go someplace even stranger and being so terrified of being uplifted and having to come to again in a stranger place that I had to find some degree of comfort somewhere. And the only place that I found it was in the bush north of Rideout in, in Kenora. And I felt more secure the longer that I prowled that bush. And I found a, a little cave behind a copse of, of fir trees in the side of this pink granite cliff. And I put stuff in there. And I put candles in there. And I put little pieces of paper and pens. and. And when it got too weird for me, I'd, I'd run over there and I'd hide in that, in that cave. And when I was five, six years old, I thought the cave was about the size of this stage. 
I thought it was huge. I thought it was enormous. But I found it again when I came home when I was 24, and it was like maybe the size of this chair. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I thought the trees in front of it were huge, but they were only little tiny things. And there was only like three of them, and I thought there was a whole mini forest around them. But what came out of that was this idea and this feeling of me that the land had attributes within it that cut through all of the confusion and all of the doubt and all of the fear. And if I sat on it and I sat with it, that I was going to be OK. And it allowed me to use my imagination to imagine what it would be like to have a real family and our real brothers and sisters and all of those things. And the start of my storytelling started in that little cave in that rock. And when I was taken away as a, as a 60s scoop kid and, and transplanted into the suburbs of Toronto, which is like going to Mars, again, it was remembering the comfort and assurance that I got from the land that basically allowed me to stay sane in that very, what became very abusive and very demeaning adoptive relationship. And so I've always held on to the idea of pink granite and, and spruce bogs and, and pine trees and, and the smell of lichen on rocks and all of that stuff and, and fresh blueberries and the dew and eating that as a kid and all of those things. And so the land has always been a very, very elemental thing because of that assurance and that comfort that, that it always brought me. And I always associate that with Northwestern Ontario. That's echoed in your book as well, Jane, though. I mean, that, that, that comfort of the land. I mean, like Liam wanting to be there as part of the land and wanting to grow things. And it, yeah, it, it's a powerful connection. I think, I, you know, when Richard was speaking here, I was thinking about what happened to me when I was taken to the suburbs of Toronto. Now, obviously, under completely different circumstances, and it wouldn't have been, I mean, nearly as traumatic for obvious reasons. but. Nevertheless, I do remember being grief-stricken uh, in terms of the landscape that I had left behind and terrified because when we moved for the first time to a city street, I remember going outside to play and turning around and looking at the houses and I had no idea which one was mine. And I've never forgotten that experience because every single house was the same. So I didn't know where my family was in terms of this kind of row of similar looking architectural dwellings. And that was a, that was a, big, uh, a big change for me and a big fear, actually. But the other thing I remember was that I could look at, I could go into my father's little office and look at a photograph, if, I mean, of all the things that one could never imagine romanticizing, the head frame of the mine and getting sort of choked up. <laughs> and knowing, oh my God, I've lost that forever. I'm six years old and I'm never going to see that again. And the fact I was right because that mind disappeared. But it was that sense that it was a big shock. So I can only imagine what the shock of not only losing the landscape, but also losing all of your family connections. I mean, it just seems that that would be unimaginably difficult and dark. Mm -hmm. I like the fact as well that uh, we found out a little bit more about Finlanders in your book yes. and how uh, the characters in your novel, like Liam and, and his family, learned how to ski thanks to the, the yeah, Finlanders. Right. And his dad got back yeah. and forth to school. So that was fun. Are there, um, oh, I can't believe we're here in Thunder Bay and we have shy people. No, here they Thank come. Thank you. Here they come. They're, they're, they're Go too ahead. worried they're going to be subjective. I didn't to want to because my nose <coughs> is red like Rudolph and I can hardly breathe. But I didn't want to miss tonight. I'm really sorry. Do you have uh, some words of wisdom for a person like myself who is aspiring to be a writer? Uh. Uh. Wisdom. Um, <laughs> precious, precious commodity. Um, yeah, I, I don't worry too much about the process. We're, don't worry at all. Because I was told when my people found me again that I was supposed to be a storyteller and I didn't know that until I was 24 years old. And I thought, how am I going to do that? I, was, I had a grade 9 education. I'd basically grown up on the streets and, and all sorts of things and been homeless. And I had, no, I thought, no skills. And the teachers of my people said, you already have the tools within you. And they said to me, 
you need to use your eyes so that you can see something to such an in intimate degree that you'll be able to describe that to someone else so that they'll be able to see it too. You have to be able to use your ears so that you can hear sounds so clearly, like the sound of a woman laughing in an empty room, so that you can describe that with words so that somebody else who's never heard that can see it too. You need to be able to feel things so that you can understand the touch of a baby's cheek or the skin of old people, so that you can describe that in such detail that somebody else can feel that too. You have to know how it feels to have somebody leave you and have somebody return and to experience that feeling so that you can feel it so intensely that you can describe it in such a way that somebody else can feel it too. You have to be able to have a full range of your emotions and to understand what you think so that you can write your thoughts in such a way that somebody can think those thoughts too. All of those tools you already have within you. And I never ever forgot that. And I haven't taken any courses or any training after that at all. And I've relied on that information to guide the things that I put on paper. So your skills and everything that you need to do this wonderful job is right within you right now and always was. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Those are Jane's words of wisdom. And the other thing is, I always say that there's a different, I mean, it's saying the same thing, just slightly differently, that there's a big divide between career and vocation. Career being all that publishing stuff and marketing and all that kind of crazy nonsense that you should forget about altogether when you're writing. And vocation is what Richard was describing. It's like, it's a vocation. It's something that comes to you. It's you. Only you have your memories and your imagination. And you have something that is unique to say. Thank you. That was very powerful. I did receive a dream uh, last July. And so I've been slowly you know, gaining my momentum to fulfill that dream that I received. And uh, coming here to see you tonight was definitely part of that. Thank you very much. Oh, nice. Can I just respond to that before he, before sure. he leaves? Don't work toward the dream. Take the next action that brings the dream a little closer. Uh -huh. And then take the next action that brings a little oh. closer. If you work toward the dream, you're always going to be working really hard. But if you work toward, if you work, take, work toward taking those little action steps, the dream gets closer to being true rather than making it that. That makes action. a lot of sense, Richard. Miigwech. Oh. Well, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the authors for the wonderful books that you've produced. I've had the joy of reading two of your novels from each of you. And uh, I thank you for coming here to Thunder Bay. Thank you. Uh, a question to Richard, and then maybe, Jane, a question for you. First and foremost, uh, again, Richard, I'd like to thank you and commend you for putting into words and explaining to a person like myself what the residential school system has done to the Aboriginal culture and the Aboriginal people. It, it leaves me wordless, and I thank you very much for being honest and having the courage to do that. And from a point of view of a storyteller and a writer, um, did the uh, fact that your uh, people not having a written language benefit or hinder you in becoming a storyteller and being able to produce those stories in written form? It was the biggest boon that I ever received because oral tradition is literature. And when the elders and the teachers of my people told me that I was supposed to be a storyteller, they also undertook to teach me how to do that. And what they did was they started teaching me with or about and with orality to be able to go within myself and to bring a story out through the physical mechanisms that I have and to be able to use my brain and my heart in conjunction with that physical energy to give something shape and to give it substance. And they allowed me to discover with, that I had that inherent voice I was talking to that other lady about and to get in touch with that inherent voice and to just learn to let it flow. And when I was grasp, firm enough grasp of that, 
it was actually an easy thing for me to take that energy that I'd discovered and put it into a hand and start making those mechanics on paper. So it was them allowing me to discover that I had an inherent voice, that I always had and that I always will have. And it was my frame of reference that Jane referred to that gave me the rich mine of material to start telling those stories for other people with. So it was orality in the beginning that gave rise to the written word that we're reading today. I would like to add something to that, which I think is really interesting. And that is that, um, as you may know, Ireland is a country that has more Nobel Prize winners than any other country. And presumably, obviously, those were written books. But it's also a country that was driven for millennia by the oral tradition. And so, for instance, many, many of the most famous Irish poems were written in Irish in the original language, or not written, excuse me, composed um, by the Bardic schools in Irish. And Bardic schools were places where both men and women could attend. And this was you know, 1,500 years ago. But in order to be accepted as a bard in the Bardic schools, one had to compose and memorize and orally deliver 20,000 lines of poetry. So many of us also have that same, well, I even think the world has the oral tradition as its narrative basis because, I mean, Ireland being a country that held on to it perhaps <coughs> a little longer than most Western European countries because they're out there on the edge. Um, but nevertheless, that's the, that's the structure of that's the structure of literature. Jane, a question for you in your unique setting, uh, unique in my understanding anyways. You are, um, uh, have a partner who's a, a, a well-accomplished uh, artist. Has his creativity and his style of uh, expression influenced you in terms of being an author? Absolutely, because as Richard said, one of the things, I noticed the first thing that was mentioned was you have to be able to see. And you do have to be able to see. And I was lucky enough to be actually quite young when I married this guy who was quite a lot older than me. <laughs> and still is. <laughs> and it's a great pleasure, I have to say, to have somebody around and go, well, I don't care how old I am, look at him. You know? no, whatever the case. I was taken by him, and uh, we traveled together fairly extensively for the first three or four years that we were together, and he was constantly, constantly drawing. Um, his, his paintings and his sculptures are quite wild and abstract, but he makes extremely vivid and realistic renderings of the outside world. And so um, on these trips, that's what he does. And I would be trapped somewhere while he was drawing you know, six flowers and taking all day to do that. So I would suddenly start paying attention to those six flowers on the edge of a road surrounded by pebbles and dust and you know, perhaps in a way that I never would have had I not been in the company of this man. So I think he had a huge effect on me. I learned how to see the world in a very careful and closely observed way. Thank you both. Thank you. Hi. Um, I just wondered, what, what was the earliest, uh, the earliest thing that you'd seen or that you'd written that you actually, like, I don't know when it would have been in your whole life history of just writing stuff that you actually went, yeah, that was pretty good. I, th I think I'm going to try it again. <laughs> I think I remember it verbatim. <laughs> It was, when I grew up, I wanted to be a monkey swinging from tree to tree. <laughs> and that was the first thing that, that anybody ever gave me any notice for. And I think it was in grade one. And we were just introducing, introduced to rhymes. And that, I was just sitting there thinking about it. And then it just kind of came out of me. And when it came out of me in class, everybody laughed. And I thought, well, wow, that's got some juice. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I want to try another one. So I tried another one. And, and that was the, the first thing that actually had resonance. And it was really amazing to me. Because again, in, in 19, by then that would be like 1962, 1961, 
northern Ontario, native kids in the school that I was going to, well, there was only one of me, so uh, <laughs> I know for a fact that we weren't getting very much attention. Um, but when I came out with that little ditty, everybody laughed and I had everybody's attention. And I thought, this could be good. <laughs> In my case, I, I don't remember a child, although I did write a really stellar play about Francis Drake. I do remember that. Um, but I don't remember that sort of moment of thinking, you know, maybe I really could do this in spite of the fact that I'm a Canadian woman, because believe me, back in the day, that was not necessarily the case. No one around me ever well, nobody I knew was an author, and in fact, it wasn't one of the sort of career possibilities that was handed out in high school. Uh, but I do remember the moment when it, I was a young adult. I had a child by then. I had always written on the sly, but one moment I came down at breakfast time. Emily was in her high chair, and I had a number of um, stepkids as well that lived with us full time. And everyone except for Emily had left for school, including my husband, who was a teacher. And all of a sudden, I realized that the configuration of things on the breakfast table and the objects around were telling me a story. In other words, they kind of, in some way, they reflected people's personalities or their character or the kind of interaction that had been going on at the breakfast table among people. And at that minute, I knew I was going to write things. And I remember that vividly. It was like an awakening, really. It was like almost like a religious experience for me. I mean, the sort of the life history of objects suddenly <laughs> made itself clear to me. And after that, I knew. And I remember that my husband came home from the university and you know, said, well, I'm going, I don't know, golfing tomorrow. And I said, actually, no, you're not. You're staying home with the kids because I'm going to your office because I'm going to be a writer. And to his credit, he didn't laugh at me, at least not openly. <laughs> I've been a journalist for, for a long time, and I hadn't written any fiction. And I remember sitting in the newsroom at the Calgary Herald and working on a feature piece for the paper, and it was like I physically got a nudge in the ribs. And I had no idea what that was about. And I tried to ignore it at first, but then it happened again. And I thought, well, maybe I should go to the doctor. Because it actually <laughs> did feel like somebody was going, stay away me. And it happened frequently enough that I went to the elder that I was learning from at the time, and I said, hey, Jack, something really weird is going on at work. And he thought it was going to be a really good one. Uh, <laughs> but I said, well, I'm working on this story. I keep getting like this nudge. And he said, well, what kind of nudge? And I said, I told him exactly. It felt like somebody was nudging me in the, in the ribs. And, and I said, I don't know what that's all about. And he said, it's a story. It's a story telling you that it wants to be born. And I went, wow. And I walked around with that for a while, and I didn't know what to do with it. And I just kind of kept asking, what am I going to do with you? And about three weeks later, I was feeling really homesick because I'd been reunited with my family and I'd gotten used to being with them and I got really used to hearing that sound of my people talking. And I was in this big newsroom in a metropolitan city and I felt homesick for that sound, you know? <laughs> Those little boys back there, they ever talk funny sometimes, eh? And oh boy, me, I wanted to hear that. <laughs> And I just felt it so immense. I just wanted to hear it. And my mother didn't have a phone at that time. So I knew that if I phoned her, somebody would have to walk like two miles from the band office to her house <laughs> and then walk back with her. And so I'd be on the line for all that time waiting to hear that sound. And then I remembered that story. So I pulled out the typewriter in my part. Remember typewriters? <laughs> I pulled out the typewriter, and I put my fingers on there, and I just wrote this line. And the line I wrote was, get a lot of tourists this way now. <laughs> and as soon as I wrote it, I felt myself going, that's it. That's the sound I missed. So I kept on going. And what came out of it was the first paragraph of my first novel, Keeper and Me. Oh my goodness. And when I read the first paragraph of that novel nowadays, 
that's the words that came out of me that night, and it was the story that was asking to be born. And it was, eventually. Fantastic. Nine months later. Little band and baby. <laughs> Jane, were there stories for you that were asking to be born as well? Not in my conscious mind, but they must have been there because there they are. Um, and I, I wouldn't say that I consciously felt that there was a story, but then as Richard explains it, it doesn't really, re the story doesn't often reveal itself to you until, it, until you're really into it or perhaps past it. And so um, I know that there were, for instance, my, my family's Irish heritage was something that I'd always wanted to write about simply because the history in Canada to, that I was being taught anyway when I was a child was either English or French and it was as if there was nobody else here and that includes Aboriginal people and people of different backgrounds who were also immigrants to this country. And the Irish of course had been marginalized to such an extent during the 19th century and, and really quite severely discriminated against Irish Catholics. Mm -hmm. uh, the Orange Lodge was the driving force in Ontario, and if you were a Catholic, you were not really in favor with the Orange Lodge. So um, it, was a, it was a story that hadn't been told, so that when I sat down to write away, part of the incentive, I think, was just an exploration of that because I didn't know anything. I yeah. wanted to find out what was it like to be a 19th century person in Ontario and be Irish. I learned that from reading your book as well. I mean, like, I, I had no idea about the Irish connection. I'm a Newfoundlander, so I knew about the Irish connection to Newfoundland. Which is but huge. Huge. Mm -hmm. But here in Ontario, who I did not know. So that was a real interesting revelation as well. And your descriptions of the potato famine and the smell and all that, it was just so evocative as well. It was the story, it, for me, it was a first time experience learning that story. So. Um, Come on, Northwestern Ontario. Come on, Thunder Bay. We have questions that we want to ask these wonderful people. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to follow up more about the Irish aspect of away. Um, all of the, uh, the songs and the poetry that's in that, is that part of something that you researched and incorporated, or is that something that you made up once you got into writing this book yourself? Um, I would say it's a combination, actually. Uh, there it certainly are actual Irish poems, mostly of the variety that I described before that are anonymous and were part of the oral tradition and then were handed down in, in, in Irish, translated often by Frank O'Connor, the great Irish author. Um, but I also, as a result of reading, 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 I read everything that had to do with Ireland. I had no idea where I was going, and I was lucky enough also to be able to get into archival material that no one had touched in this country, and there's plenty of that around, by the way. If anybody wants to go to the National Archives, virgin archives are not a problem. Um, there are plenty, plenty of stories. But mostly I would say that it was a combination of those two things, so that I had, I'd read enough that it had become almost cellular with me so that I could feel the poetry in myself. So, just to follow up, does that mean then the poetry was poetry you generated or wrote, or was it a translation of something that you found during your history? Uh, it, it was both, but the translation, I mean, there there is a, an acknowledgments page or two at the end of this, of, of a way, in which there, there will be several citations concerning things that were actual quotes. The, two, the, the landlords in the beginning are extremely um, interesting characters. Are they partly yours and partly history, or? Well, I mean, yours? the history of the landlords of our, the Anglo-Irish landlords is uh, one I think that is much grimmer and uh, and and often a little tougher than the two men that I invented, and I did totally invent them, but. Having said that, it wasn't always like that because nobody, nobody is a complete stereotype, I mean, with the exception of absolute psychopaths. For instance, all the landlords were not totally evil. Um, and in fact, those land, there was a reference to a particular family, the De Veres, um, uh, who, who made it their business to concern themselves with the plight of their tenants and in fact were very, very insistent that Parliament do something about the uh, what they called the coffin ships, which were the ships in which the Irish were um, 
emigrating from Ireland and were in such terrible shape that, you know, perhaps a third of the people who left actually managed to achieve gross eel and then another God knows how many died there because of cholera. Um, and uh, the, so one of, the, one of the landlords was extremely loosely based on, on a de Vere. And then just the, the connection between um, Iron Horse and your book is this connection with this new schooling system that comes in. Do you remember how um, the father in your book yes. was a teacher in this what appears to be a secret schooling system that was designed to preserve um, Irish culture, but somehow the government works to eliminate it. Yes, and, and um, no, that, that, that's true actually, I'd never thought of that, but it was in, during the Cromwell times in Ireland, it was against the law for the Irish, that would be the original people of the island, to, be, to, to learn how to read and write, it was against the law. Also against the law for them to speak their own language and to own a horse or land or whatever. And so at that point, um, a kind of uh, uh, um, clandestine schooling system started very informally called hedge schools where they would hide in the hedges in bushes with a, with a schoolmaster who was self-taught himself. And the children would be taught, which is why you know traveling ang Anglo-Irish landlords would be kind of stunned when these starving little urchins were speaking to each other in Latin. They know what the hell is going on, or sometimes in Greek. But the, but uh, of course, a national school system came through, and that was pretty much the end of the hedge schools. However, having said that paled in comparison to what happened with the residential schools here. I mean, as, as far as we know, first of all, the children were not necessarily removed from their homes and taken you know, hundreds of miles away to another location. It's just that they were, again, not permitted to speak their language. But at least they were, they were obviously, at that point, once the national school system came in, encouraged to learn how to read and write. How much time have I got? <laughs> uh, how about music? Does the music play any part in your thoughts and thinking? Because I noticed with the uh, Irish, there's always that Celtic music kind of, and a tenor banjo involved in it and, and nice bouncy music. And with the Aboriginal side now, there's always the drumming in the background and different powwows and different kind of stuff and different rattling and all that. And uh, did that play any part in your thoughts as you're thinking of uh, these uh, t stories? That's right. Thank you. I think I always reference the sound of a drum in my thinking and in my centering before I start to work. Um, one of the things that, that was a gift to me in the very beginning of all of this was being reminded that the drum paid a, played a central role and a central part of, of our daily lives and that I could find one, even if one wasn't around, by just putting my hand over my heart and closing my eyes. And I was also given the idea of wordlessness back in the time when I was 24. Notice the way I said that, back in the time I was 24. <laughs> and what they meant by that was, was when I did that and I found that drum inside myself that I was to empty myself of all the words in my head. To empty myself so that I could be filled with the words that I wanted to use. And I think what happened, and especially with Keeper and me, that the sound of that drum very much became the rhythm of the writing. And it, it became the tempo of the story, and it kind of infused that whole fir first novel with that sense of primal music. And I don't think I've lost that very much. I think that I, I tend to, to always try to keep a, a certain lilt and tempo to, to the things that I do. So music plays quite a, bit of, quite a, quite a big role in, in the way that I work. Okay. Um, I was going to say I, I love the idea of emptying the words that are already in your head out of your head before you start to write. I think it's what the Buddhists call the noise, really. It's all the stuff you're worried about and all the, all the stuff, all the noise. Um, and that, of course, does allow for the music to come in. I think that you know, one of the things I've certainly seen in Richard's writing and in all good writing is that feeling of there being the right pulse, the right rhythm to the prose. I think prose has more poetry in it than people like to admit. I think that you do get into a kind of a chant 
situation where you can hear, you can sort of hear the music of your prose when the writing is going well. And when the writing isn't going well, suddenly things are not right rhythmically or musically. And I always know when that happens, it's time to stop for the day. Um, and of course, it's something that you have to work with as well. It, doesn't ne it isn't necessarily given to you right away, but it is certainly a part of composition. And I think it's like musical composition, you know, you're sort of receiving it in some way or another. And that way is often a very musical way. Think about music in your book as well with the dancing. Oh, yes. What an important role dancing played. Well, that was very percussive, too. Yes. Yeah, I, that was pretty interesting. And I, I, I remember I, after I had finished, I mean, I'd been finished with a way for three or four years. I was invited to the Dublin Literary Festival. And someone in the room asked me the question, were you thinking of Michael Flatley? who had arrived in the meantime, apparently, with river dance in the, in the intervening years after my Aidan Lanigan, and I'm sure not in any response to Aidan Lanigan. But I hadn't noticed, because I was on to another book, I wasn't paying attention to the Irish, and I said, who is Michael Flatley? And the whole room cheered. <laughs> <laughs> we have somebody who is going to ask a question. Okay. Let me steal the mic. So you write very difficult topics, but you're so funny. Like, you're hilarious. Both of you have a great sense of humor. So it makes me believe you're joyful people. So I'm wondering if it's more difficult to write crotchety characters. So in other words, of all the characters you've ever written, which ones have been the most difficult to write and why? And that's my question. Great question. Good question. I guess in my novel, Ragged Company, which uh, came out in 2008, there was a character in that novel whose name was Double Dick. <laughs> <laughs> Not for the reasons you might think. <laughs> but his, his name was Richard Richard. His parents got into this big fight over whether, because his father was French and his mother was Ojibwe, whether it was, it was going to be Richard or Richard. So the wise woman in the village said, give them both. So he became Richard Richard or Richard Richard, whoever was winning the argument. And when he got to the street, his, his nickname, his street name became Double Dick. And he was a really, really hard character to write because he was more or less functionally illiterate. And to be able to give him a way of describing the mm -hmm. things that he saw in the world with that low level of literacy was a really, really hard thing to do. Because in the end, he became somebody who was joyfully expressive. Mm -hmm. That dire street situation that he lived in, because the, the novel spins on a, on a quartet of people who are chronically homeless. And he describes his interrelationship with the world and its people with this low vocabulary and low sense of, of words in a way that really brings him closer to the hearts of, of me, the writer, and the people who read that novel later. And uh, when his part of the story comes, I'm not going to tell you how that comes if you haven't read the book. But when his part of the story ends, it's a very, very emotional thing. And I realized when I, when I got to that, that I'd found a way to give him those words and to give him that expressiveness, despite the, uh, the character <coughs> and the background that he came from. So that was a really tough, a tough, the, t the toughest thing to write that I've encountered so far. I would like to observe, however, that within that toughness, there was also humor. Wow. Because uh, let's face it, uh, you know Richard Richard and Double Dick and all of that. It can, there's, I find that um, even in the most earnest kind of writing that I'm doing, even when I'm weeping, when I'm writing, I, there's always a, I can't help it. There's this little something in me that comes around the corner and throws some humor in. And it's not intentional. It's not even conscious. It just happens. And I think that's true of your work as well. Um, the hardest character for me was uh, a main character, actually, in um, The Underpainter. And that was a man I had to write about. 
I had to do it. I don't know why. Don't ask me why. Obviously, the story was given to me in some way or another. But he was not a particularly nice man. He was a complicated man. I, I myself felt empathy for him, but I didn't really like him. Mm -hmm. And I had to write about him in the first person because that was the way it was coming to me. I tried to write about him from a greater distance um, in the third person, but I realized, no, I got about a third of the way through the book and I realized this is not working. I am not seeing the world through his eyes. And the only way that I'm going to do that, he's a male after all, what do I know, um, is to get right inside his head and look out through his eyes. And I had to go back and change those first hundred pages from the third person to the first person. And then I was able to see the world from his point of view. But it wasn't a particularly pleasing point of view, I have to say, and not a particularly positive one either. But it was necessary. And, um, and I th the book worked, to, for, for me anyway. Uh, in the final analysis, and there was an, a, a, a final scene in that book that was not, didn't turn out the way I had hoped it would turn out. It was absolutely unlike what I wanted my character to do, mm. but he did it anyway. And I realized when I was finished that, of course, he would have done that. That was in his nature. So I had learned him well enough by the time I got to the end of the book to let him wrap it up. <laughs> You know, I, I should say, too, that, that one of the things that I find endlessly fascinating is that I'm actually doing this, that I'm actually sitting there and I'm churning out book after book, and, and people are reading this stuff. No, it, it it's, is, it's a, that's a big miracle. It is a huge we get invited to places like this, and, and I think it's a, an honor and a privilege to yeah, be doing the absolutely. work that I'm privileged to be doing. And I giggle like crazy. I sit there and I think of that and I'm thinking, oh, look what I get to do. I get to go to my desk and I get to create all this stuff. And so if you talk about joyful, yeah, no, it's if, true. if you're not doing cartwheels and doing handstands when you're going to your work area, find a different line of work. Well, if, and also it's important to remember that even when you're writing about the darkest, creepiest, scariest, saddest, most heartbreaking stuff, it's still a joyful experience. The, the actual act of expression mm -hmm. is a joyful experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mavis Gallant once famously said, gosh, isn't it amazing that we spend our lives, and in her case, I mean, obviously there's a connection to reality, but she said she herself spends her life making up stories that never happened to people who never existed. <laughs> <laughs> 